around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to welcome you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday. It's May the 10th, 2022. This is the 38th program here on the harvest, the end of the age, and the second coming of Christ. I hope and I pray that you have been encouraged. I pray that you have been enlightened and that you have come to a greater understanding about the rapture of the church, the end of the age, and the harvest. There's only one harvest. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 8.20, he said, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. What a tragic statement that the prophet had to make concerning Israel, God's people. Sadly, a lot of people today are going to miss out concerning God's divine plan for their lives. I want to encourage you to be submitted. I want to encourage you to pray and read your Bible. There are times, admittedly, I do not feel like praying. I do not feel like reading my Bible. And I know, and I tell the Lord in my prayer life, I know my efforts and my works do not merit me anything, but you've got to be faithful. Luke 18, verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Why would he ask that question? Because he knew concerning the second coming, his second coming, the the element of unfaithfulness would exist. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. He knew how difficult it would be. I, like anyone else, want to see a revival. But I don't think we're going to see revival till hard times come. People are too comfortable. They're at ease in Zion. I believe it's Amos 6 and 1. Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. So many people are at ease today. They just, you know, it, it's a cakewalk. But when Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Amos 6 1, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. The word woe means great is your grief because the impending judgment of God was at the door. It was at the door. And um, when something is at the door, that means very, very close proximity. And uh, I do believe America's going to see some very, very grave and arduous and difficult days. Again, as we said yesterday, Daystar turned us down on our programming, said our program did not meet their programming needs. And so we invite you to continue to pray that God would open because the response that we got when we went on CT and Christian Television Network, and by the way, if you don't have cable, or excuse me, uh, Daystar, excuse me, I'll get it right. If you don't have direct television or DISH Network, you can uh, uh, stream CTN on cable and get the TV programs that way. We also post the TV programs the following week. But the response we have been and continue to get from CTN is, is tremendous, and uh, sadly, it's mostly people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Got another letter the other day from an 87-year-old brother, and they all say the same thing. Thank you for preaching the Word. Thank you for preaching against sin. Thank you for trying to get us ready. And years ago, the Lord spoke to my heart, do not forget the older people, the older generation. I'm one of them now. You know, I'm, I'm less than three years from being 70 years of age. I think about that, and I'm like, wow, where did it go? But no matter what, if God will give me the grace and the strength and to keep my mentation, to keep my mind, I will preach his word in spite of all the opposition, 
in spite of all the dislike, in spite of all those who castigate, criticize, that's all right. That's all right. It's like God told Samuel. You know, Samuel was was grief-stricken. He was hurt. He was hurt. You see, Samuel, and that's, that's the human nature in all of us, Samuel took it personal. I've learned to never take anything personal about the ministry because if you do, you'll live a life of perpetual hurt. You will live a life of perpetual hurt. Why? Because the world and the carnal people, they'll hurt you, folks. They will hurt you constantly. That's just the nature of people. They will hurt you. They will injure you. They will harm you in some capacity. But as, as, as God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, they've not rejected you. He said, they've rejected me. They've rejected me. And so when I preached the word of God, and that's what the Lord told me years ago, because I was in a place and a state of discouragement, the Lord said, how many people did I ask you to save? None. How many have I asked you to heal? None. How many, how many have I asked you to deliver? None. He said, if you've preached my word, you have obeyed me. You have obeyed me. And so I, I, I want to faithfully, regularly preach the word of God. But when God told Samuel, it had to lift the burden off of Samuel. He said, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being the Lord of their lives. And sadly, many times men take it personally. Well, they don't like me. Well, there may be some truth to that. But listen, if you're preaching the Word, if you're preaching the Bible, you know emphatically it's not you. It's the Lord they're upset with. I'm just a newspaper boy. I'm just a delivery boy. I just bring you the mail, the message. I'm just a messenger. I have no authority in myself. The authority is in the word of the Lord. Where the word of a king is, there is power, Ecclesiastes 8, 4. And who can question the word of the king? Well, no one was supposed to question it. Well, Jesus Christ is king of kings, Lord of lords, and we don't question his word. We just preach it and let it fall where it falls regarding the hearts and lives of men. We want to go back to... Matthew chapter 13, verses 40 and 41 today. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world or the end of the age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. Stop right there. Slam the brakes on. Don't turn. Listen. Listen to me. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Who's he removing? Is he removing the righteous? No. He's removing out of his kingdom all that offend and them that do iniquity or works of sin. Folks, how much more plain can it be? You know, I noticed some weeks ago practically every Christian television ministry was on the kick of preaching redundantly over and over and over again, all of them. It's like they had the democratic talking points. They were all teaching from a different passage of Scripture, but it was about a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, if you believe that, that's fine. I used to believe it because I was taught it. That's what I was taught. But then at the age of 39 years old, I said in the pulpit, 
I'm not going to eat a bite of food in my life till God moves in my life because there's something not right. I, I didn't know what it was. I knew for certain it wasn't sin. It was something else that was wrong, just terribly wrong. And I saw the face of God. And he showed me that it was a fallacy. It's error. And I began to teach and preach. And, of course, I wrote my first book, The Second Coming, A Second Look, meaning look at it again a second time. Thoroughly search the Scriptures again concerning what you believe. Are you right? Be like the Bereans. Search the Scriptures and see if these things be true that I speak. And so the removal is not the righteous. The removal is the wicked. Notice what he said. All things that offend. The Greek says all things that are scandalous. Scandals. And them that do iniquity. That's who he removes, not the righteous. Why? We are left to inherit the earth. I said we are left to inherit the earth. Did, did, did Jesus not promise us all that in the Beatitudes? Did he not promise us that? Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The wicked do not get to inherit. God does. We, because we are saints of God, inherit the earth. And, um, you know, some guy, well, let me say it this way. A lot of people believe what I teach, but they won't say anything because they'll be cut off from the inner circle of people. Don't, don't, don't be public. You can believe this privately, but don't believe it publicly. Well, I'm, I'm not cowardice in my spirit. I'm not afraid. And uh, I'm going to keep preaching the truth no matter what. We, we cannot compromise in this hour. Verse 41 is so absolutely clear. The angels of God gather his elect. They're secured, they're suckered, they're put in the barn or the garner. But the angels also gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity or commit acts of lawlessness. You see, Lawlessness is exploding in the earth. Lawlessness is exploding because our politicians, our governors, our leaders, they're lawless themselves. They say, do as I tell you to do, not as I do. Washington is the most crooked, corrupt place on the earth. It really is. People up there lie, cheat, dishonest. Uh, you know, the FBI seized the United States senator from North Carolina, Richard Byrd. They seized his cell phone and his brother-in-law's because before COVID hit, they sold a bunch of stocks. Now, they put Martha Stewart in prison for what they call inside trading. Well, Richard Burr, why would, why would the FBI confiscate your phone? But nothing happened to him. He had to resign from his place. He was chair of the intelligence committee, and so he got intelligence. He got information, and so they sold and they made money. You and I do that. They put us in prison. This whole thing is corrupt, and this is what Jesus is going to remove. You see, God put man on the earth. He didn't put man in heaven. He had creatures already there in heaven. Only God knows when God did all of this, you know, the, 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 the multitudinous of angels and creatures and beings, cherubim, seraphim, all of these creatures. And then when God created the earth, where did he put man? He put man on the earth to, to have a power and authority and subdue it, and then to replenish the earth and multiply. And so God has always wanted the humans, you and I, on the earth. Now, Jesus tells us, this is the words of Christ. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his 
kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. This parable clearly validates to every to every one that are scripturally honest. There can be no tribulation rapture before or during the harvest. Now I believe at the end of the harvest, God will secure, will be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, but he will remove the wicked into the lake of fire. And we will return to this earth that's been purged, and we will begin, he will set up his earthly kingdom in the earth, and we will begin to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's why in Revelation 1, 6, says he hath made us kings and priests. I don't know which one you'll be. I don't know which one I'll be. But he's made us as kings and priests. But when you read this parable and you then get into these verses, which I'm elaborating on now, you read them, you're, you're, you study them, you're very honest and, and judicious in rightly dividing the word of truth. He tells us emphatically here in verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Second Thessalonians 1 8 says, Jesus comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he's going to remove. Now listen to me very closely today. To believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is to believe there is a period of time during the harvest that the harvest, the harvest, the process of the harvest will cease for a period of time when Christ and his angels are separating the wheat from the tares. To believe that, is to embrace error because the harvest is one simultaneous event. There's no breaking up in the harvest. There's not a pre-tribulation harvest and then a post-tribulation harvest. Jesus only taught one harvest. One, not multiple harvest. And that which is removed, he tells us what is removed. What is removed? All things that offend and them that do iniquity. That's who he says is removed. He's going to take that out. I had a dear lady email email me the other day, and, you know, the light went off in her head. And she was so elated. She was so happy. She said, when you talked about Noah, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then there in verse 40, I believe it is, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. So when you keep the Scripture in the proper context, who was taken in the days of the flood? Verse 39, Matthew 24, 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He's taking away the wicked. Jesus said all things that offend, all things that are iniquitous or lawless. That's who he's removing. Thus, verse 40 Matthew 24, 40, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. The one that's left inherits the earth. The one that is taken is cast into eternal damnation and separation from God. This is the reason for the harvest. Why is there a harvest? And to think, we're not even over here yet to the large net. I'll, I'll, I'll even get deeper in this concerning the large net. We're just, we're just still talking about the wheat and the tares. Are you a wheat or are you a tare? Which are you today? 
To me, God forbid that I would sound arrogant or pompous or prideful, but to me this is so elementary and so simple now. When God began to illuminate my mind and let me see all of these little different nuances, in my opinion, and please don't think I'm being arrogant, I give so much Bible that the, 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 the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is false. It is absolute false. Now, I know 99% of most people believe in that. My grandparents believed in that. I believed in it. I preached it. I taught it. But it's kind of like circumcision to me. The disciples were grappling to change from circumcision to faith in the vicarious work of Christ that was accomplished on the cross. They were struggling. That's all they ever knew. That's all I'd ever been taught. But see, God is merciful. God will leave no one in the darkness that wants to know the truth. I want to know the truth. This is the purpose for the harvest. The harvest is to separate the wheat from the tares. But what most people preach is, well, God's going to take the wheat out. That's the separation. And then when he comes back, he's going to deal with the tares. No, he deals with both wheat and tares at the same time. There's no difference. There's no difference. Matthew 13, verse 30. Listen to me. Let both wheat and tares grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn or garner. Same identical message that John the Baptist preached. You see how John was in, it was in alignment with the teachings of Christ before Christ ever taught this? Matthew 3, 11 and 12. John said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he it is who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garnel, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is the same identical message, if you superimposed Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 over Matthew chapter 13, they are identical. They are identical. Jesus said prophetically through John, he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The fire is so great, it cannot be quenched. It cannot be put out. But before that, he gathers the wheat into the garner. That's why we're going to inherit the earth. Yet, and I'll, let me say this again. I wrote my book, it's either 95 or 96. It was 94 when I went on the, the fast. One says late 95. And I sent the book to my denominational leaders at that time. I wrote them letters sent them a copy of the book. I said, read the book. Tell me where I'm wrong. You know how many responded to me? Zero. No one responded to me. Not one. If I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong. But they didn't because they can't. You see, I know what they don't know. I know what they know because I once preached it. Not anymore because I know the truth. And to hear men say, the great tribulation is the wrath of God, that is so erroneous. That is so full of error. The wrath of God is in the seven vials. Revelation 15, 1. Revelation 16, 1. Make it exactly clear and plain to anyone that can read. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. In them what? In those bowls or those vials. The wrath is not in the seals and the trumpets, the wrath is in the vials. But they won't even look at that honestly. 
You say, well, you're arrogant. I don't mean to be. If I sound that way, forgive me. I don't mean to be. But when you have the encounter that I've had with God, and I don't sit here and talk about my encounters with God, but I've had some tremendous divine encounters with God where the Holy Ghost has overwhelmingly come upon me physically and spiritually because I've, I've paid a price many a time to be in God's presence. I, 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 I'm 67 years of age. I am so hungry for God. I've been preaching this gospel nearly 44 years. I am so hungry for God. Still to this day, still to this day, I'm hungry for God. My, 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 my appetite is not satisfied. I said my appetite is not satisfied. I have a great hunger and thirst for God and his word. So when does Christ return? He will return in the time of the harvest. Because right prior to his coming, it is the angels that does the separating between the wheat and the tares. Remember the disciples said, we're going to go do that for you. He said, oh, no, no, no. No, you'll gather up wheat with the tares. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. The Bible is clear. When he returns, his angels will gather the tares and anything else out of his kingdom that offends and those who commit iniquity or are lawless. This is why the Antichrist will be able to succeed. He's the lawless one. For the mystery of iniquity, iniquity, lawlessness, Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity or lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, shall wax cold. People are waxing cold. This is why you need the Pentecostal fire of the Holy Ghost to warm up your spirit, amen. After Christ removes the, the, the tares, and the angels will do that, bind them, bundle them, and burn them. Matthew 13, 30, gather together the tares, bind them and bundles to burn them. There's the process, bind, bundle, burn. Bind, bundle, and burn. You might say the three Bs, bind, bundle, burn and burn. The redeemed represent the wheat. Is that not what all farmers gather into the garner, the wheat, or do they put the chaff in the garner? Do farmers put the chaff in the garner? No, they don't. They don't put the chaff in the, in the barn. It's called winnowing, where they would throw the chaff and the wheat up into the air, and the wind blows away the chaff that which comes down is the wheat. That's what is kept and put into the barn. And yet, people want to say it's something else. The psalmist David, he even understood this process. David understood this process to a T. Psalms chapter 1, verse 4. Well, let's, let's, let's start at verse 3 to help you to, uh, to see the synchronicity of this. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now watch this. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. That's the winnowing effect, where you throw the wheat and the chaff up in the air, and it's called winnowing, and the wind blows away the chaff. The wheat comes back down. Therefore, Psalms 1, 5, therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the godly. God 
knows what's going to happen to the redeemed. God knows what's going to happen to the blood ball. God knows what's going to happen to his church, the body of Christ. And he says, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You see, God knows the righteous will be put in the barn. The righteous will be put in the garner. But the ungodly, they're going to perish. They're going to be blown away. And God's going to do the winnowing. Uh, John said his fan is in his hand. He's going to winnow it. Separated. The wheat will be gathered into the garner or the barn. The tares, they're going to be burned up. Again, the redeemed, we represent the wheat. The tares represent the lost. Notice something very significant here. First the tares, then the wheat. Let's go back to Matthew 13, verse 30. Let both grow together. That tells you there's no pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know what to do with some people. I really don't. Let both grow together until the harvest. The harvest is when the separation takes place. But until then, the wicked and the righteous are going to be in the earth together, together, together until Jesus gets ready to return and he sends his angels to begin the process. Matthew 13, 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time, kairos, K-E-R-O-S, however you want to pronounce it, time of harvest, that's a divine appointed time. There's a time for every farmer when the harvest comes in and you got to go reap it. If you don't, you let it die in the field, all of it will be lost. You can't wait. When the corn comes on, green beans, okra, squash, tomatoes, you got to get them because if you wait too long, they'll be lost. The good will be lost. That's why you have to have a harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, well, we know the reapers are the angels. He tells us that. The angels are the reapers. Gather ye together first the tares. That's the process. Gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is all taking place simultaneously at the second advent or the second coming of Christ. Now I'm going to give you another passage. You've heard me quote it probably a hundred times or 200 times throughout the years. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Let's stop right there. What day is Paul talking about? That day shall not come. That is emphatic. It's a day. It's a particular day. Well, what day is it? We have to go back to verse 1 in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. His coming, our gathering together unto him. That day, verse 3, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Every one of you listening to this, every one of you watching this, ought to admonish your friends, your purported Christian friends, listen to this teaching or order the book. I have a whole chapter in the back of the book where I talk about the resurrection. I hear all these guys teaching about the pre-tribulation rapture, but I never hear them mention the resurrection. And the resurrection is half of the rapture. But they don't talk about the resurrection. But let me tell you what Jesus said about the resurrection in John 5, 28, 29. He said, marvel not at this for the hour is coming and the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good 
unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus just taught two resurrections, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. As I said yesterday, the number seven is mentioned 51 times in the book of Revelation. Don't you think if there was a seven-year tribulation for God's sake, he could have added one more seven? But he didn't. But what did he, what did he tell us? 1,260 days. Time, that's one. Times is two. Now you have three and half a time, three and a half years. Uh, Revelation 13, 5. He shall continue 40 and two months. What is 42 months? Three and one half years. Three and one half years. This, the, if there's a seven-year period concerning the tribulation, why doesn't God tell us that? Well, he doesn't because there's no seven-year tribulation. Again, that's just conjecture. Ask any so-called prophecy teacher, show me the phrase in the book of Revelation, great tribulation saints. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. This is, this is a divine judgment of God at his second advent. This is why he would not allow the disciples to remove the tares before the harvest because he feared they would uproot wheat. No man is qualified to make that judgment. Only Jesus Christ, the Father, placed all judgment into the Son's hand. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. When, when, when Abraham was talking to Jesus there in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, Genesis 18, 25, Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham understood God only does the right thing. John chapter 5, verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Why will Jesus Christ be made the righteous judge? Because he became man. He understands mankind. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our fragilities. He knows what it means to have a perverted, evil thought. Many times, sadly, we react to that thought instead of resisting it. We respond to it. We react to it. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul said, For the time of my departure is at hand. I am now ready to be offered. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at they, and not to me only, but all them also that love his appearing. What is he saying? The Lord, the righteous judge. Paul himself establishes the fact Jesus Christ is the righteous judge in all things. Those encounters that men had in the Old Testament were a pre-incarnation of Christ. That's why in John 8, verse 56, uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad in it. And they said, they are not yet 50 years old. How can you make that statement? He said, before Abraham was, I am. That's a powerful passage of Scripture that proves Jesus always was and has been. But see, the Pharisees were so blind. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Those were pre-incarnations of Christ in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the harvest, don't get mad. Listen, don't get mad 
and want to fight, listen to the truth. Listen to the truth. Christ does not mention in the parables of pre-tribulation rapture because there's only one harvest and there'll be one separation at the end. There's only one second coming of Christ. Uh, Hebrews 9, 28, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When he comes the second time, he's not coming to pay the price for sin like he did the first time. When he comes back the second time, he's coming as king, as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I would ask you humbly, is that a pre-tribulation rapture or second advent rapture? Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Old Testament only taught two comings of Christ. He's going to come as a, a lamb and going to be slain. When he returns, he returns as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of Israel and everything else. King of kings and lord of lords. That's what the Old Testament taught. Listen to this, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Paul said, I charge thee therefore before the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom. Is that pre-tribulation or is that post-tribulation? Well, let's look at it. He shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom. Well, see, that lines up exactly with what he taught Paul did in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall be caught up together, or the, the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, looking back at first, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick. Who is that? That you and I, would, well, we may be, I'm, I'm, I may be dead too, I don't know. We which are alive and remain. That's the quick. That's those who are living. He will judge the quick and the dead. Who are those dead people? Those are dead people who have died in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Paul said, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, living, and the dead, dead in Christ, at his appearing and kingdom. When he comes, he brings the kingdom with me. I had a guy actually argued with me one day. He said, well, the appearing is the pre-tribulation rapture and the kingdom is the second advent. And I said, you're twisting the scriptures. It's all synchronous. It is all the same event. It's the same event. Now, the dead in Christ, to show you how that this is talking about the Christians that have died in Christ, the wicked dead will not be raised for another thousand years. They will still be, their bodies will be in the graves, whether it's in the sea or in the earth or wherever. But the wicked dead will not be dealt with for 1,000 years after the second coming of Christ. It will be at the thousand-year end, after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, then the wicked dead will be raised. That's called the great white throne judgment. I have a, a DVD teaching on that. I, I get so deeply into all of this to try to help you understand. Revelation 20 and verse 12, and I saw the dead small and great stand before God, and the books were opened. Those are record books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. That's the wicked dead, not the righteous dead, because it's a thousand years later. 
the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There it is. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that's the righteous death because the wicked dead will not be judged for another thousand years. Again, I want you to notice the synchronicity, the synchronicity that Paul the Apostle uses 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom. The next verse, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And see, that's what's the matter with people right now. They won't endure sound doctrine. People don't like me because I call sin. I name sin. You know, I, I tell people where they're living and that it's wrong. And, and if you don't get it under the blood, you'll be lost. But we don't want to offend nobody today. I'm watching ministries and ministers who are supposed to be on fire for God. They, they're walking around on eggshells. As I said yesterday, John the Baptist could not make it into most churches today. Paul the Apostle could not make it into most churches today. Can you imagine Paul the Apostle to the church at Corinth breaks out and says, hey, there's fornication among you people in here that a, a brother is sleeping with his father's wife. Oh, how appalling, Paul. My God, Paul, don't, don't say anything like that. Paul says, get rid of it, deal with it, because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If you're diagnosed with cancer, you want the doctor to cut it out that your life can be spared. Paul says, you got to cut out this malignant tumor that's in the church, the body of Christ. And, and the sad thing was, he said, some of you are glorying in it. I could sit here one day, and share with you how raunchy, randy, and rancid the nominal church is. There are so many preachers that are falling, and there are so many preachers that are quitting the ministry, and there are so many open, vacant church buildings in America today. We're going to be just like Europe. All the great cathedrals are empty you know, the old boy down there in Australia, he, he got in trouble too. And uh, he said, well, he was taking anxiety drugs and started drinking alcohol, and then he made some overtures to women. So he blamed it on the drugs and the alcohol. You see, people aren't willing to address the truth anymore. You know, when I was pastoring, I would tell my, my pastor's counsel, by the way, they were all men. I said, if there's anything that you see, you, you, you smell, you discern about me, you come to me. You come to me and say, hey, preacher, I think you're off base. I think there's something wrong in your life. I've done it to people. I've went to people and said, hey, you're living in sin. I only do that when God reveals it to me. And the reason God reveals things to men is, is for them to address it. He doesn't reveal it that you just know that they're not right. You have to go to them, and that lets them know God knows what's going on in your life. I've done that so many times, regrettably, in ministry with other ministers. I, I, I went to a, a minister, 30 years my senior. I was in my early 20s, uh, probably 25, 26. I said, God told me to tell you you're on the wrong track. You realize how hard that is for a man that age to go to a, an elder? 
I said, if you, if you don't get back on track, I said, you're going to lose your credentials. Guess what happened a year or so later? He lost his credentials. I was preaching. I was in a revival in Garner, South, uh, Garner North Carolina. I, I, I know where, where I was and the service and everything. And a, and, a, and a person's face came up before me while I was preaching. And I'm, I'm like, what's going on here? It's a revelation. He said, that brother is committing adultery. When I got home, I went to the brother and I said, you're living in adultery. You're having an affair with another man's wife. He said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Okay. A year or so later, came out. He got divorced, et cetera, et cetera. Why? He was unfaithful to his wife. You, you, you think I, I have any joy in that? But why does God do that? He doesn't want them lost. He doesn't want them going to hell. So he sends somebody to warn them. Why? Because he loves them. That's the great thing about God. He doesn't want to lose anyone. The devil wants everyone to be lost. Yet Jesus doesn't want anyone to be lost. And he will go out of his way to touch one soul like the woman at the well. He said, the man you're living with now is not your husband. You've already been married five times. She needed to be saved. She was lost as she could be. If you're not where you need to be with Jesus today, I profusely encourage you to get it right. Every one of us, we have an expiration stamp on us. We are going to expire at a particular date, time, and place. I don't know mine. You don't know yours. Only a couple men, Joshua, I believe it's Joshua 23, 12, I may be wrong. He said, I, this day I go all the way of the earth. He identified the very day he was going to die. Think about that. He identified the very day he was going to die. God let him know that day. Most of us, we don't know. We don't know. Joshua 23, 14, we don't know. He said, I'm going the way of all the earth. God bless you. I'll see you Monday. Have a great week. What's left the of The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.